Learn English through stories as for PDF. Adapted and modified by Kulwant Singh Sandhu. Contents. The Secret Garden Chapter 4, Martha of Part 1. The Secret Garden. Chapter 4, Martha of Part 1. When she opened her eyes in the morning, it was because a young housemaid had come into her room to light the fire and was kneeling on the hearth rug, raking out the cinders noisily. Mary lay and watched her for a few moments and then began to look about the room. She had never seen her room at all like it and thought it curious and gloomy. The walls were covered with tapestry with a forest scene embroidered on it. There were fantastically dressed people under the trees, and in the distance, there was a glimpse of the turrets of a castle. There were hunters and horses and dogs and ladies. Mary felt as if she were in the forest with them. Out of a deep window, she could see a great climbing stretch of land, which seemed to have no trees on it, and to look rather like an endless dull, purplish sea. What is that? she said, pointing out of the window. Martha, the young housemaid, who had just risen to her feet, looked and pointed also. That there? she said. Yes. That's Tate Moore, with a good-natured grin. Does thou like it? No, answered Mary. I hate it. That's because thou art not used to it, Martha said, going back to her hearth. Tha thinks it's too big and bare now, but Tha will like it. Do you? inquired Mary. Ah, that I do, answered Martha, cheerfully polishing away at the grate. I just love it. It's none bare. It's covered W.I. growing things as smells sweet. It's fair lovely in spring and summer when th gorse and broom and heathers in flower. It smells o' oh honey and there's such a lot o' oh fresh air, and th sky looks so high and th bees and skylarks makes such a nice noise hummin' and singin'. Eh? I wouldn't live away from th more for anything. Mary listened to her with a grave, puzzled expression. The native servants she had been used to in India were not in the least like this. They were obsequious and servile and did not presume to talk to their masters as if they were their equals. They made salams and called them protector of the poor and names of that sort. Indian servants were commanded to do things, not asked. It was not the custom to say please and thank you and Mary had always slapped her eye in the face when she was angry. She wondered a little what this girl would do if one slapped her in the face. She was a round, rosy, good-natured-looking creature, but she had a sturdy way which made Mistress Mary wonder if she might not even slap back if the person who slapped her was only a little girl. You are a strange servant, she said from her pillows rather haughtily. Martha sat up on her heels with her blacking brush in her hand and laughed without seeming the least out of temper. Eh, I know that, she said. If there was a grand missus at Misselthwaite, I should never have been even one of T.H. under housemaids. I might have been let to be scullery maid. But I'd never have been let upstairs. I'm too common, Anne, I talk too much Yorkshire. But this is a funny house for all it's so grand. Seems like there's neither master nor mistress except Mr. Pitcher and Mrs. Medlock. Mr. Craven, he won't be troubled about anything when he's here, and he's nearly always away. Mrs. Medlock gave me T.H. place out o' oh kindness. She told me she could never have done it if Misselthwaite had been like other big houses. Are you going to be my servant? Mary asked, still in her imperious little Indian way. Martha began to rub her grate again. I'm Mrs. Medlock's servant, she said stoutly. And she's Mr. Craven's, but I'm to do the housemaid's work up here and wait on you a bit, but you won't need much waiting on. Who is going to dress me? demanded Mary. 
Martha sat up on her heels again and stared. She spoke in broad Yorkshire in her amazement. Canna fa dress thyson, she said. What do you mean? I don't understand your language, said Mary. Eh, I forgot, Martha said. Mrs. Medlock told me I'd have to be careful or you wouldn't know what I was saying. I mean, can't you put on your own clothes? No, answered Mary, quite indignantly. I never did in my life, my eye addressed me, of course. Well, said Martha, evidently not in the least aware that she was impudent, it's time Tha should learn. Tha cannot begin younger. It'll do thee good to wait on Thyssen a bit. My mother always said she couldn't see why grand people's children didn't turn out fair fools. What with nurses and Bane washed and dressed and took out to walk as if they was puppies. It is different in India, said Mistress Mary disdainfully. She could scarcely stand this. But Martha was not at all crushed. A, hey, I can see it's different, she answered almost sympathetically. I dare say it's because there's such a lot o' blacks there instead o' respectable white people. When I heard you was common from India, I thought you was a black too. Mary sat up in bed furious. What, she said. Why, you thought I was a native you, you daughter of a pig. Martha stared and looked hot. Who are you calling names, she said. You needn't be so vexed. That's not th way for a young lady to talk. I've nothing against th blacks. When you read about them in tracts, they're always very religious. You always read as a black's a man and a brother. I've never seen a black Anne. I was fair pleased to think I was going to see one close. When I come in to light your fire this morning, I crept up to your bed and pulled th cover back careful to look at you. And there you was, disappointedly, no more black than me, for all you're so yeller. Mary did not even try to control her rage and humiliation. You thought I was a native, you dared. You don't know anything about natives. They are not people. They're servants who must sell them to you. You know nothing about India. You know nothing about anything. She was in such a rage and felt so helpless before the girl's simple stare and somehow she suddenly felt so horribly lonely and far away from everything she understood, and which understood her, that she threw herself face downward on the pillows and burst into passionate sobbing. She sobbed so unrestrainedly that good-natured Yorkshire Martha was a little frightened and quite sorry for her. She went to the bed and bent over her. Hey, you mustn't cry like that there, she begged. You mustn't for sure. I didn't know you'd be vexed. I don't know anything about anything. Just like you said, I beg your pardon, miss. Do stop crying. There was something comforting and really friendly in her queer Yorkshire speech and sturdy way, which had a good effect on Mary. She gradually ceased crying and became quiet. Martha looked relieved. It's time for thee to get up now, she said. Mrs. Medlock said I was to carry Tha breakfast and tea and dinner into TH room next to this. It's been made into a nursery for thee. I'll help thee on with thy clothes if Tha'll get out o' bed. If TH buttons are at TH back, Tha cannot button them up Tha's self. When Mary at last decided to get up, the clothes Martha took from the wardrobe were not the ones she had worn when she arrived the night before with Mrs. Medlock. Those are not mine, she said. Mine are black. She looked the thick white wool coat and dress over and added with cool approval. Those are nicer than mine. These are th one's tha must put on, Martha answered. Mr. Craven ordered Mrs. Medlock to get him in London. He said, I won't have a child dressed in black wandering about like a lost soul, he said. It'd make the place sadder than it is. Put color on her. Mother, she said she knew what he meant. Mother always knows what a body means. 
She doesn't hold with Black Hersel. I hate black things, said Mary. The dressing process was one which taught them both something. Martha had buttoned up her little sisters and brothers, but she had never seen a child who stood still and waited for another person to do things for her as if she had neither hands nor feet of her own. Why doesn't Tha put on Tha's own shoes, she said when Mary quietly held out her foot. My eye did it, answered Mary, staring. It was the custom. She said that very often. It was the custom. The native servants were always saying it. If one told them to do a thing their ancestors had not done for a thousand years, they gazed at one mildly and said, It is not the custom, and one knew that was the end of the matter. It had not been the custom that Mistress Mary should do anything but stand and allow herself to be dressed like a doll, but before she was ready for breakfast she began to suspect that her life at Misselthwaite Manor would end by teaching her a number of things quite new to her, things such as putting on her own shoes and stockings, and picking up things she let fall. If Martha had been a well-trained fine young lady's maid, she would have been more subservient and respectful, and would have known that it was her business to brush hair, and button boots, and pick things up, and lay them away. She was, however, only an untrained Yorkshire rustic who had been brought up in a moorland cottage with a swarm of little brothers and sisters who had never dreamed of doing anything but waiting on themselves and on the younger ones who were either babies in arms or just learning to totter about and tumble over things. If Mary Lennox had been a child who was ready to be amused, she would perhaps have laughed at Martha's readiness to talk but Mary only listened to her coldly and wondered at her freedom of manner. At first she was not at all interested, but gradually, as the girl rattled on in her good-tempered, homely way, Mary began to notice what she was saying. Hey, you should see em all, she said. There's twelve of us em. My father only gets sixteen shilling a week. I can tell you my mother's put to it to get porridge for em all. They tumble about on T.H. Moore and play there all day and, Mother says T.H. heir of T.H. Moore fattens them. She says she believes they eat T.H. grass same as T.H. wild ponies do. I dickon he's twelve years old, and he's got a young pony he calls his own. Where did he get it? asked Mary. He found it on T.H. Moore with its mother when it was a little one and he began to make friends with it and give it bits o bread and pluck young grass for it. And it got to like him, so it follows him about Anne, it lets him get on its back. Dickens a kind lad Anne, animals likes him. Mary had never possessed an animal pet of her own and had always thought she should like one. So she began to feel a slight interest in Dickens, and as she had never before been interested in any one but herself, it was the dawning of a healthy sentiment. When she went into the room which had been made into a nursery for her, she found that it was rather like the one she had slept in. It was not a child's room, but a grown-up person's room, with gloomy old pictures on the walls and heavy old oak chairs. A table in the center was set with a good substantial breakfast. But she had always had a very small appetite, and she looked with something more than indifference at the first plate Martha set before her. I don't want it, she said. Tha doesn't want thy porridge, Martha exclaimed incredulously. Not all. Tha doesn't know how good it is, put a bit o' treacle on it, or a bit o' sugar. I don't want it, repeated Mary. Eh, said Martha. I can't abide to see good victuals go to waste. If our children was at this table, they'd clean it bare in five minutes. Why? said Mary coldly. Why? echoed Martha. Because they scarce ever had their stomachs full in their lives. They're as hungry as young hawks and foxes. I don't know what it is to be hungry, said Mary, with the indifference of ignorance. Martha looked indignant. Well, it would do thee good to try it, 
I can see that plain enough, she said outspokenly. I've no patience with folk as sits and just stares at good bread and meat, my word, don't I wish Dickon and Phil and Jane and T.H. Restum had what's here under their pinafores. Why don't you take it to them, suggested Mary. It's not mine, answered Martha stoutly. And this isn't my day out. I get my day out once a month same as T.H. Rest. Then I go home and clean up for mother and give her a day's rest. Mary drank some tea and ate a little toast and some marmalade. You wrap up warm and run out and play you, said Martha. It'll do you good and give you some stomach for your meat. Mary went to the window. There were gardens and paths and big trees, but everything looked dull and wintry. Out, why should I go out on a day like this? Well, if thought doesn't go out, thou'll have to stay in, and what has thought got to do? Mary glanced about her. There was nothing to do. When Mrs. Medlock had prepared the nursery, she had not thought of amusement. Perhaps it would be better to go and see what the gardens were like. Who will go with me? she inquired. Martha stared. You'll go by yourself, she answered. You'll have to learn to play like other children does when they haven't got sisters and brothers. Our Dickon goes off on T.H. Moore by himself and plays for hours. That's how he made friends with Titch Pony. He's got sheep on T.H. Moore that knows him, and birds as comes and eats out of his hand. However little there is to eat, he always saves a bit o' his bread to coax his pets. It was really this mention of Dickon which made Mary decide to go out, though she was not aware of it. There would be birds outside, though there would not be ponies or sheep. They would be different from the birds in India, and it might amuse her to look at them. 